So thank you for your written testimony. We would ask you to uh, summarize that in five minutes. You recognize uh, Mr. Clark. Representative Gates and members of the House attending today, Dr. Gosar, uh, at this field hearing, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, let me make seven quick points. First, one of the original sins of government that has carried uh, and caused the poor treatment of the January 6th protester defendants is uh, the uh, lawless formation of the uh, House Select Committee, the January 6th Committee, leading to it acting in a one-sided and due process free way. That committee was gerrymandered by Speaker Pelosi, operated without a ranking member or counsel to the ranking member. Liz Cheney was granted vice chair status to try to cover that up. The committee then had a series of carefully scripted by Hollywood hearings where the entire Q&A path was pre-written and meshed with cherry-picked snippets of highly edited uh, audio, I'm sorry, video and uh, audio doctored video. The committee interviewed 1,000 plus witnesses, it says, but only about 200 transcripts have been released. Second, the January 6th committee worked with regime media, the New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, and MSNBC, etc. In that way, uh, the fake narrative that an insurrection had, been, had occurred on January 6th was blasted everywhere. Based on secretly recorded uh, video, we now have on tape Nancy Pelosi's documentary and daughter uh, and her friends admitting that no real insurrection ever occurred. The collective effect of the January 6th committee's shameful way of proceeding, plus the reinforcing media blitz, poisoned the jury pool in Washington, D.C. Trial venue transfers out of D.C. should have been permitted. Media narrative mongering, uh, indeed, uh, was also the pre-original sin, therefore, of this entire issue because it laid the groundwork for the January 6th select committee's hatchet jobs. Third, many of the defendants were swept up in a vast dragnet that I believe violated the Fourth Amendment because it was the equivalent of a general warrant that our framers sought to ban. This was done through the use of geofencing technology and cell phone data warrants sent to telecom providers. Additionally, many protesters arriving after President Trump's speech uh, in, the had, uh, in the ellipse had finished uh, did not see any signage that areas normally open to the public were closed that day, setting up a trespass trap for the unwary. Fourth, the Justice Department did not treat these cases with appropriate respect for the First Amendment rights of the protesters. The 2020 presidential election was incredibly contentious, and many citizens in this country disagreed with mainstream media pronouncements that they should, in essence, sit down and shut up about the election and how it was conducted. By contrast, I was at the Justice Department getting daily updates about the Marco Hatfield Federal Courthouse in Portland being attacked night after night after night in the summer of 2020. Insurrection is a far more appropriate moniker for that targeted Antifa lawlessness than a largely spontaneously assembled crowd being agitated by tear gas and rubber bullets. Yet the First Amendment issues led to uh, the self-agitators in Portland being treated very differently and with special kid gloves. This takes me to my fifth point. The January 6th defendants uh, have not uh, been dealt with in the same fashion as the Antifa and BLM protesters in 2020 who engaged in terrible conduct, threatened the White House, did millions of damage in property to property uh, in that summer in the lead up to the presidential election. This is a flat violation in terms of comparing those two categories of defendants or potential defendants of the equal protection of the laws. Many Americans think the selective prosecution on display here is blatant. Sixth, there are widespread Brady violations as to how these defendants are being dealt with uh, today, and I'll confine that to just two areas uh, uh, for our purposes today. First, the concealed or underreported footage uh, issue uh, around the Capitol. So the House is to be commended for allowing Tucker Carlson, Julie Kelly, and John Solomon to review the footage. And second, it's hard to imagine that with 800 plus or so unreleased January 6th committee deposition transcripts, that there's not at least some exculpatory evidence in there that has not yet been seen by the relevant defendants and their lawyers. The January 6th committee, in short, acted like a star chamber, and there is no reason for this Congress to let that go on. Seventh and lastly, the judges on the federal district court here in Washington, D.C. seem to have come under the spell of the January 6th committee's original sin, and in that way they allowed the constructed mainstream media narrative to influence their decisions. 
and as a legal matter, thereby and large allowing a statute designed to close an obstruction of, of justice loophole that Arthur Anderson exploited in the Enron debacle to be applied to entirely different activity that uh, in many instances is protected by the First Amendment and should appropriately be treated differently. As a result, Antifa and BLM revolutionaries, and it's not ex an exaggeration to call them that, who engaged in worse conduct, largely got off scot-free, and worse yet, uh, many of them left with bags of cash from civil settlements. By contrast, the sentences being handed down against January 6th defendants are wildly disproportionate. For all these reasons, I'm glad to be here today before you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clark. I'm going to come to you, Mr. Clark. Um, who's in charge of Washington, D.C.? Uh, well, Muriel Bowser is the mayor, and there's a city council, and there's a home rule statute that Congress passed. So it would be um, Congress, right? It's Congress is the ultimate backstop and, and control who over Who at the time was that. speaker? I'm sorry? Who at the time was speaker? Nancy Pelosi. And does that speaker have jurisdiction over the safety and welfare of uh, anything in the Capitol? Yes, the relevant committee, as I've researched it in the past, you know, functionally uh, reports to her. How does a, a small little uh, paragraph that was put in the NDA years ago that allows the federal government to uh, in, uh, incarcerate an American system without cause for any due reason, how does that affect this case? I'm not sure I know the answer to that, uh, Congressman, to be honest. Well, I think it played a big part because it allows the government to detain somebody without real merit. And that was placed into an NDA bill and is still part of the, the process. Um, did Nancy Pelosi have uh, advance a warning in regards to uh, uh, intelligence that there was problems, uh, things happening? My understanding is yes, Congressman. There were uh, reports uh, from Secret Service agents. There were DHS reports that have gotten a lot of coverage. There's a lot of advance intelligence. And indeed, there's a remarkable story that I don't think has gotten enough press in Newsweek published on about the one-year anniversary of January 6th, which indicated that uh, there were uh, tactical teams, you know, sort of the, uh, the, the most highly uh, trained and elite units like the hostage rescue team, they were sent to the Capitol in advance uh, because of all of these reports it, by the Justice Department, by the Attorney General, the Acting Attorney General, Jeff Rosen, acting individually without apparently really in a lot of coordination, it's, it's puzzling actually why you would do that and you wouldn't have a harder security perimeter if you had those, those teams there on the outside to stop people from coming in in the first place. So uh, when you look at 16 versus 20, was there a bigger presence on 16 versus 20? Uh, I mean, it looks to me like things were locked down in, in 20 around the Capitol. I mean, there were those famous fences. Uh, you know, I've seen the pictures. Uh, it looks like a military zone. It's not the kind of thing I expect in America. It reminded me, actually, of the time in, when I was in law school, you could drive past the White House. And now, you know, uh, that's, been, that's been locked down, apparently due to, to terrorist threats. But I thought what happened with the Capitol after, uh, you know, um, uh, the last, uh, in, you know, in connection with the last presidential election for the inauguration was true overreach and overreaction. So, uh, Ms. Pelosi had the ability to uh, take that information and, and put it to, to good work, but she turned down National Guard and additional Capitol Police, did she not? Yes, she turned it down, and uh, uh, Muriel Bowser, the mayor, turned it down as well. And uh, who did she have a meeting with in regards to the military? Uh, I'm not recalling precisely who she, General she met Milley. with. General Milley. General Milley made some incriminating yeah. uh, comments. You, you've, the, you've reminded me of that. Yes, I remember. Can you expound on that? Well, I mean, I, you know, it seemed to me that General Milley uh, was engaged in conduct that uh, is shocking. I mean, him, him coming, his commander-in-chief was Donald Trump at the time. He is coming and basically indicating that, uh, you know, he's willing to work with Pelosi to engage as a safeguard against Donald Trump. And we know, you know, even though the second impeachment against Donald Trump tried to cut short what his speech was and present it as if he was urging people to violently attack the Capitol, that he actually told people to march peacefully and patriotically. So General Milley had to have uh, been aware of all of that and been aware of what was being said in internal meetings, and yet he pretended as if Donald Trump was some kind of threat, Congressman. So let me ask you this. Um, 
Ms. Pelosi made this, uh, uh, made this comment, that President Trump has a right to a trial to prove his innocence. <laughs> this that, is exactly what's transpired with anybody that was arrested on January. This is an inversion of our system, right? We have a presumption of innocence. And indeed, I heard this from Benny Thompson, who we've talked about as the chair of this wayward and lawless January 6th Select Committee. After I, uh, because I realized that they were, you know, lining me up as one target uh, in their uh, in their hearings, I refused. Uh, well, I had initially refused based on executive privilege, which I was instructed to take and invoke uh, on on law enforcement privilege, with the which the Justice Department instructed me to invoke uh, on lawyer client privilege. You name it. The January 6th committee rejected it. I could see where they were headed, so I took the the Fifth Amendment privilege, which. Uh, the innocent under Supreme Court case law are entitled to take as well. Benny didn't stop Benny Thompson, the chairman. He went on MSNBC with Rachel Maddow, and he said that if you take the Fifth Amendment, that's part and parcel of being guilty. So this is the mindset uh, of these folks that we face. I think that Benny Thompson and Nancy Pelosi are of a piece. So I, I give him to leave with one last comment. Pictures are worth a thousand words. Somebody made the comment that this was acts against democracy. And that would be against the people. So it, to me, it seems like we ought to turn the people loose in regards to all videos, all videos being accessible to all members of the United States, and to help us find those people undercover, whether it be Antifa, FBI, whatever. That's the only way we're going to get to the bottom of this. Thank you. Mr. Norman. First of all, I just want to thank you for y'all for testifying. You know. I know Sarah came to the office, Ashley's mom and, um, and others. This is heartbreaking, uh, particularly, uh, Jerry, with your nephew and the way y'all have been treated. <clears throat> you know, it's, um, it's interesting that I, there was a police officer, and I'm from South Carolina, who came to the Capitol, and he just, he's a 25-year Marine, uh, been around a long time. He sensed something was wrong, and he left. Uh, because he said something's just not right. The gathering that took place um, where it was people that turned their hat around, they were 50 to 100 of them. Uh, the picture of Ray Epps letting people in, where's the arrest for him? The lady I met at a conference who uh, I just was sitting beside her from South Georgia <clears throat> who had 10 FBI agents show up. And... Uh, said they were going to arrest her. She said, for what? They said, you were in the Capitol. Show me evidence. Uh, they had taken a, when they showed the picture, it was the hotel she stayed in. It was not the Capitol. It had a, a rendering like it. This was in South Georgia. Um, so uh, all that is just, this is what happens in third world countries. This is not supposed to happen in America. I want to thank you for having a voice and not being quiet. Uh, and for, for coming here, it's not easy, I know, uh, for those who, it's just unjust, it's not right. Um, and Matt, I want to thank you for putting this on. Uh, Congressman Gates has been, has been on this from, from day, the day that it happened. Going forward, the tapes have not been released. We've heard a lot of different ideas as to why or excuses. The people are being arrested as we speak. What is your, from a legal standpoint, what is your opinion? What should we do as Congress, congressmen? And how would we, what's your take? But really, either one of you. So, Congressman, I, I think that uh, what I would recommend is that you proceed stepwise. I think the most urgent need is that every single one of the defense counsel and every single one of the defendants, they need to be given access to the entirety of that video record because they need to try to find any Brady material in there. I think that the system in which, uh, you know, overzealous prosecutors, they will screen it for you and they'll tell you what they think is exculpatory. With all due respect, I think it's defense lawyers who need to be able to look at that kind of material and then decide what they think is exculpatory so that they can design appropriate defenses for their clients. As to public release, initially I had the view 
uh, that uh, all of it should be put out so that it could be crowdsourced, much like WikiLeaks revelations were. But I, I, do, I do recognize what I've seen Julie Kelly uh, say to the media and in print, which is that there's the, these you know, nefarious organizations like the ones that were you know, threatening uh, you know, uh, uh, some of the witnesses here today with these Saul Alinsky-like tactics, the sedition hunters. So I recognize that there is a, a valid concern about not putting it out in that way. So that's why I would recommend the stepwise process. Make sure that all of the information gets to defense counsel. That's the most urgent thing. Um, uh, uh, Congressman Norman, I, I represent three of the guys, right? So it's for everybody that's you, – you may know it, but there is a system of looking at the video evidence that the DOJ has made available to defense lawyers and to the individuals. It's burdensome. It's unfair. It's terrible. It's nasty. It's terrible. It's hard work. And then Congressman Loudermilk and his team have made it available to people that asked. I, I've looked at it. I've gone in and looked at the video myself, Tucker Carlson, Julie Kelly, et cetera. <laughs> Um, it's very hard to do. I, I sat in there for hours. You can turn it up to times 40, and you're trying to watch this thing whip past you, right? And, uh, and, and they've been great. I, I give their staff a, a lot of encouragement. But I, I differ with the general here. I, I think at a certain point, the sedition hunters are going to find us anyway. Pelosi already gave the tapes to everybody anyway. Or the FBI, I'll give it to them tomorrow. So at this point, I don't, we don't need 44,000, but there's 10,000 there's 10, hours that would reveal what went on. I sat and watched the pipe bomber. We haven't even mentioned the pipe bomber. The two major political parties, we're told, faced hot bombs that didn't go off the hour after they were set, the night of January 5th, and somehow were discovered the next day. Hot bombs. They say they were real bombs. The ATF told us that. You go on there and you can watch the videos. You can see the pipe bomber. The FBI's lying. The pipe bomber didn't, I don't think they went to Virginia. There's a car behind another car on C Street next to the Capitol Hill Club. The bomber goes in and out of the car. No one's talked about it. You can go look at it yourselves. It's marked. We tagged it. My point is we need more eyes on this so that more people can find out who was there. Uh, uh, Congressman Sessions has asked DOJ in his capacity on one of the committees to tell us who the uh, undercover agents and agents are. They're refusing. You guys know that. So let's let it out there and let's let the public figure out who the people are. And we'll know every Ray Epps from here to Long Beach, California and back. And, the, and justice will be served because they won't stop if they can keep hiding. If they can keep hiding, we'll never know who did what. Mr. Mr. Clark, uh, I have a question for you specifically. Do you believe you were framed by the January 6th Select Committee? Oh, absolutely, Congressman, I do. I think that, uh, you know, I, I was the only uh, person at the Justice Department, you know, at a significant level, the Senate confirmed spot, who was interested in investigating the election. Well, I know that to be the case, Mr. Clark, and the reason I know that to be the case, and I'm glad I get to say it here in a public forum, is because I became aware of evidence that U.S. attorneys were developing, showcasing fraud in the election. And, and perhaps that evidence would lead nowhere, perhaps it would lead to the crime of the century, but it should not have been squelched. And Bill Barr was suppressing evidence and stopping it from being developed that showcased irregularities, and, and not just irregularities, fraud, where people were fraudulently requesting those ballots. And I told my friend Scott Perry that on the floor that I was aware of that evidence. And now I believe uh, we see you and we see our colleague Scott Perry unfairly targeted. And I want you and the world to know that if you had a willingness to stop the US Department of Justice from rat holing cases and squirreling away information that would have been helpful to learn on that day, you were acting your patriotic duty to do so. And I, I am deeply ashamed as a member of this government, particularly at the way you've been treated. Yeah, so um, I, I want to get back to this, this, this point, because D.C. is special. And it's not in a good way. <laughs> you know? And, and uh, you know, the Congress has the power of the purse, or we thought we did. We really don't right now. You know, it's divided by the executive branch because they put everything in these national emergencies. So back to you, Mr. Clark. Uh, this this, uh, this uh, system here in uh, Washington, D.C., is it conservative or liberal? It's, uh, it's worse than that. It's radically left. So yeah, on the 0 to 10 scale, you'd probably put it at 15. 
I, yeah, and, you know, it's like uh, uh, the uh, the movie where the the uh, amplifier goes up to eleven. <laughs> now, yeah. Spinal tap. Spinal tap. That's it. So, so. Good to see you. Good to see Congressman. Thanks for your kind words. And I, I, I'll talk to Andrew about something. Just give her a theme. Yeah.